You're listening to All Things 3D, where we talk about the world of fabricating, designing, and capturing in the third dimension. Balzer, and this is All Things 3D, and this is our weekly show on Friday Premium Review. Yes, it's showing up a little late today, starting at 12 instead of our normal time of 9.30. But, you know, I've been a little bit preoccupied. Um, I don't know, I've been kind of been in a, a little bit of a VR funk. Uh, thanks to my, uh, my new friend Steve, I've got these new opera-style glasses, and with my own device and a uh, company named Occipital, I can actually immerse myself in a, a, a really mm -hmm. interesting 3D environment. But we're going to talk about that later. First, as normal, we get into our news items. So let's see what we got coming up first. That's right. I, I, I had an embargo earlier on, and I couldn't really talk about it. But HP, if you're familiar, they've got a Sprout unit. Uh, this essentially is a full desktop type uh, PC that has the ability to sense or detect um, your your hands or any other object and allow you to move around but what was missing previously was the ability to do 3D scan and a lot of people realized early on that they used some type of structured light scanning system uh, so it was just a matter of time and sure enough that did occur uh, yesterday at 105 Pacific Standard Time and they released it it is a free software upgrade what is not free though, and I think a little pricey, is this little turntable that you see in the middle there where the shell is located. And from the questions that I had in the embargo, essentially it's a, a very reasonable, um, what do they say, 500 micron uh, mesh density as well as about an 8 inch by 8 inch by 8 inch volume and um, let's see can't remember the the high detail textures but it does actually do texture mapping excuse me texture mapping and as you can see here they have a Dremel uh, printer hooked up to it but uh, so what they're trying to indicate here is that once you scan an object in you can then 3D print it now there's a lot of other tabletop type scanners there's the one from MakerBot uh, there's a couple of other ones out there one of the more professional versions is the next engine which is what I have um, but in the entry market there hasn't been any, very many of them and from the examples that I've seen in fact I've got a little video that I can launch right here that kind of show the new you new generation uh, of uh, Star Wars exactly films ILM Skywalker sound and Lucasfilm itself are in there we go. so here they have an actual item in place uh, notice the pattern that, so as mentioned, it's a structured light system which projects a, a particular type of pattern that is laid upon the object and then the distortion or the deformation in the pattern is what they record and from there they can determine the depth of the object. And if you get the depth information then you can develop a mesh. And if you, you can see here every 45 degrees they are turning the object, taking a projection image and then combining all these to create the mesh itself. Uh, obviously this seems to be uh, not in real time, a little advanced speed. Uh, they didn't indicate to me how fast it actually scans, but I'm thinking this is probably sped up about 10 times, uh, anywhere between a minute to three minutes possibly, which seems to be uh, how a lot of these tabletop scanners are, are scanning. But the, the positives, you don't actually need the turntable, but if you want an automatic process, uh, you should get it. The sad thing is it's $299. I think the Sprout, especially for the consumer market, is a little bit of pricey. But uh, with the tabletop, it obviously pushes it into a different area. But if you want to do 3D scanning, and from what I saw, it does seem to do a good job. And I kinda, I'll kind of i go ahead and accelerate towards the end. And there you go. So there's the uh, full textured uh, 3D mesh. Looks very similar to the model. Um, 
Now, I don't know how much cleanup they had to do on it, but if they didn't have to do and there's the actual mesh itself. Um, it looks, in my opinion, pretty good. And I've dealt with a lot of scan uh, type devices, and so I'm fairly impressed. But again, it's at uh, 500 microns, uh, 8 inch by 8 inch by 8 inch volume is what it can scan. So it's not very large, but a lot of objects with that type of uh, scan density or mesh density, uh, this will be very useful. And again, the software is free. The platform is $299, or I should say the rotating plate. Okay, on to the next item. And, you know, since my co-host has not arrived yet, I'm going to jump right to it. And we have a special guest. So I'm going to get right into their video. So give me a moment to set it up since I messed up my, here, my videos here just a moment ago. So I'm going to go ahead and play it in the background. Imagine a world where dreams meet reality, where digital meets physical. Do humans need connection? We spend huge amounts of our day interacting with others around us. But often, when we look around us, we find the current technology is individual-focused. We miss out on real-life moments. Here at H+, we want to change that. Alice is a tabletop holographic display that enhances your life and invites connection. It is a central place to sync any type of device and to display its content from all sides. You can play games with family, connect across generations, work together cooperatively, or compete head to head. Make education an engaging experience, and even connect over voice chat to create a holographic teleconference call. For something so natural as sharing and displaying, we wanted to make something with as many viewing angles as possible. To get to where we are today, we iterated hundreds of times. We settled on a design that's beautiful, strong, and safe. It has an eco-friendly monitor, and its tempered glass has a coating that is specially designed to reflect a specific amount of light for optimal display quality. USB and HDMI ports allow devices to connect and display on the hulls. From gesture-based controls like leap motion to brain sensors and a 3D printer, we have tested them all with the Hollis and are adding more connection options to make the Hollis more natural and intuitive to interact with. Making the Hollis combined with lots of different software and hardware makes it even more complex. That's why we have assembled the best team possible to do just that and are encouraging more great programmers to develop content for the Hololist once it is released. We have Unreal and Unity SDKs available and are adding more middleware support in the future. Connection is important to everyone. You've gone as far as we can go without more support and need your help to take us to the next level. We are so excited to bring the Hololist to life and get it into your hands. I want to play baseball in outer space. I want to see fireworks from Mars. But can we come back? Of course. You know how long I've been wanting this? I mean, since the original Star Wars. So, hollow. <laughs> we have today, thankfully, Drew, um, who is, I believe, the CTO and one of the co-founders, so which means you're probably the brains behind this product, or one of them. Let's talk about it a little bit. What is this thing? Um, I've got your Kickstarter behind me here that I'll go to, but uh, kind of introduce yourself and your company, and uh, how did this come out of nowhere and immediately, obviously, exceed its pledge? Yeah, um, so Hollis was really a vision. It's based on our vision of humanizing technology. Uh, it's, uh, and what essentially it means is to bridge the gap digital world to create and design technologies that adapt to human nature and the way the real world is designed. Uh, back in 2010, we actually focused a lot on three-dimensional gesture recognition. However, soon we found that uh, the gesture recognitions are used on a flat 2D screen. Um, our idea was how can actually perceive and reach out to the pixels more naturally. Um, and that's where we started 
started researching in 12 different techniques from volumetric displays to digital holography to wearable holography. How can we naturally perceive information without, you know, less hassle? Um, and that's where we really started, you know, designing the form factor and working on a solution that's based on uh, hardware and software to allow us to achieve this kind of holographics. Uh, and that's uh, really the promise of Hollis. And uh, one, one other important point that I'd like to mention is, was, you know, to isolation and stagnation. Uh, most of the time we experience with some of the current technologies is isolation and stagnation. That is, we sometimes imagine on a dinner table, uh, I get a message and I might be disconnected uh, with uh, some of my colleagues uh, around the table or friends, families. And uh, but what we want, we and we wanted to overcome that as well. The other point is about uh, stagnation. That is the movement. Uh, is so easily available uh, sometimes uh, it just there is just no really need to move throughout the day and th that has uh, uh, serious uh, health implications so we wanted uh, you know especially young ones and kids to move some around for example this kind of digital information uh, that's being represented uh, inside Hollis so uh, uh, yeah uh, that's that's really how we came up. Uh, that's the inspiration behind Hollis, and uh, it's actually been a long, long time that we have been working on this. Uh, we have been. And there's a lot of uh, research and development that's gone into this uh, thought process, both in terms of tech and design. And uh, this is where we are today. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a fascinating product, and as I mentioned in my email to you, I had this kind of thought design experiment in my head where I take a bunch of panels four of them to be exact and create my own little aquarium because you know a lot of the video cards today can support up to four cards and I had a little thought probably wouldn't that be kinda cool but then I realized that it get, would get kinda pricey and you know we'll talk about price in a moment but what's really cool about this and I have seen this early gosh I'm dating myself here ten years ago at CES they used something kinda like a, a, a mirror so an object and it appeared in the middle but it was looked like really large like like a big barrel, um, but your item here almost looks like like a desktop game, uh, and with the pyramid shape, it's unique. And uh, as you can see behind me here, we've got some actual images, and I'm I'm assuming these are probably display images uh, when this was taken, these photographs. And I noticed when I was at the show, like I said, I didn't get a chance to look at it closely, but I saw and I said, well, that's just a kiosk. And then I looked a couple other times and I said, oh, that's kind of neat. And then I got too busy and I, you know, I didn't know if this was actually a product or not because, you know, a lot of times you see something there and it says, oh, it's $20,000. And so you kind of dismiss it like, okay, I can't afford it, so I'm not even going to look at it. But the interesting point is, and going out to your Kickstarter here, is, let's see, where was the original? Maybe they're all gone now. Yep. <laughs> I blew my chance, but uh, you started out at five hundred and fifty dollars for fifty of them, and then six fifty, and then uh, you've got them at eight hundred and fifty, and you have two different models, if I understand correctly. You have the Holus, and then the Holus Pro. And from what I could tell from the specifications, it's literally the uh, what do you want to call it? The graphic resolution uh, of the device itself, and uh, there may be a few other things. So maybe you can give us a little detail. And I'll see if that's actually on the page here. But uh, some of the applications that you have in other videos, and I'll have those in the show notes, is using it as a 3D um, portrayal of an object before printing it. Uh, and I think that's pretty cool. Obviously, you can don stereographic polarized glasses to get some kind of effect. But then you can't really walk around it. And that's the interesting thing behind this is because you have um, views on all four sides you can walk around an object. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And uh, and then also here we got somebody who's using telepathy. No, it's actually a a electro or not a mixture, but uh, brain e sensing. Data. Yeah. Correct. And utilizing that the control functionality and the emotive I've heard of before. In fact, I saw the first version back at. Uh, what was it? Uh, what's the show called? Uh, the gaming developer show. Um, 
GDC back in 2007. <laughs> so it's been a few years, but I saw the first concept of it, and obviously it's refined itself. And then here we actually have kind of like a conference scene. Actually, I think in this case it's voice interaction. But you have a lot of examples where people could play tabletop games. Obviously, you saw in the first video, you could make your own little virtual fire. Um, it's really cool. Very neat. You have two different models, and it's very reasonably priced. Like I said, creating like an aquarium would cost me about fifteen hundred dollars if you had a computer if you had everything installed here it pretty much has everything except the uh, control device which looks like it can be a tablet or a a mobile device is that correct yes and uh, I can explain a little a bit more about um, so Holos home edition is meant for consumers and families where they would literally unpack connect their uh, tablet tablet or smartphone and essentially transform their entire space um, and, uh, and the Holos Pro comes with HDMI port that means you can connect any computing device and you get a free license of our SDK uh, what that means uh, you can what we call holify any digital asset any digital content uh, whether 2D or 3D uh, we recommend 3D so that you can get multiple viewpoints uh, as it has depth information. Um, apart from that, it allows you to connect any other sensor input uh, see from different uh, videos and examples. You can easily uh, connect brain control interface or you can have a gestural interface or voice control. Uh, for us, the idea is to really foster this community of what it means to have a display that you can walk around uh, digital content what kind of experiences would people build and we are really interested in building this community we don't have it right now and I think this is a beginning of new era uh, not just uh, you know like a holographic era that uh, everybody would be talking about but also the social computing era you know 1970s has been the boom of personal computing but the time has come that we really think about uh, uh, social computing and how uh, in a group of people can enjoy the experience all at the same time. So that's uh, uh, those are the two different versions. Of course, uh, there is a difference in number of pixels uh, that's all mentioned in the Kickstarter page. Uh, how many pixels does it project on each side? Uh, how many USB charging ports and um, and so forth and so on. So there are some major differences out there. And these are located on your Kickstarter. There we go. Right there. So yes. there's your specifications. Uh, let me yes. kind of expand that a little bit. Uh, so essentially, uh, the home edition, uh, the size-wise, they're fairly almost identical. Uh, the Hollis Pro is a little bit larger. Uh, they all provide viewing angles of 360. The Pro has one HDMI port as well as USB port. Charging ports, uh, <laughs> it appears, four for the Pro, two for the standard unit. And then both have the same contrast ratio. But the next item is the monitor resolution, which is what I mentioned earlier. Uh, obviously, yes. they're not that much different. Um, so, but uh, you do have 1920 by 1920. Now, what does that mean? Obviously, that's a strange if you're familiar with uh, the uh, the aspect ratio of many monitors. It's actually 1920 by 1080. So, why is it 1920? How did you go about doing that? And then I had my next question: Is you've got four panels on this pyramid, and it only looked like there was one camera. So, how are you doing this? Or one projector? Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, actually, the display source, uh, Hollis was designed factor in mind. We wanted it to have a symmetrical form factor. Now, if we can display, uh, of course, your factor would be uh, not cubical in shape. Uh, that was one of the major concerns, uh, in term it, and it's basically a design point. So we actually design and develop. Uh, we worked, uh, you know, with other partner companies, and uh, we, you know, came up with our own little display solution out there that's uh, specifically designed for Hollis, and uh, that's what you see it in there. Uh, it's very rare. Um, uh, and I would like to make a sort of comparison with virtual reality. 
many people think, oh, it's simple enough. I can have a screen. I can have two lens, and there you go. I have the device. But uh, I would like to let them know that uh, going to mass manufacturing, it is not that thing that you cannot get off the shelf. If you were to do something like this, it will cost you nearly 50K to bring everything together because, of course, uh, you'll have to custom build it. And uh, the aspect ratio and the contrast ratio is something very hard to achieve on this uh, uh, in, in this kind of display. Now, the other thing you might also notice going a bit down is Holos Pro offers an ambient sensor. Uh, what it means is uh, one of the challenges you face with uh, reflective and opticals, uh, the amount of light that passes through a medium Hello? Hmm. We seem to have a freeze. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm back. OK. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry. Well, so uh, uh, yeah, I was about uh, the EcoView of ambient sensor. Um, so what does it mean is um, uh, it adjusts to the brightness level, the contrast level uh, that uh, 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 you can uh, have and what it also helps is with, with uh, amount of light that goes through and this also saves energy in certain situations as well so we really wanted to design a product that was uh, lightweight and also easy to use and energy efficient mm -hmm. you, could, uh, uh, you would face with uh, you know some of the uh, concepts of holography and but well, we wanted to start today, and, and we thought Kickstarter would be a good place for that as well. So, yeah, the specifications were chosen, keeping all of these points in mind. Okay. Um, well, obviously, it, it looked very interesting, and now that I know that it's more affordable, I'm going to start saving my pennies. Um, so your Kickstarter still has quite a few days left, and you still have a few units. Obviously, your less expensive versions uh, are no longer available. Mm -hmm. But uh, you still can, let's go back up to the top here. You can still get these at, uh, okay. 850 and 950 Canadian. All right, so that's Canadian. So that means $692 US dollars, you can get the standard Hollis or the Pro for $773. And again, the images look just as good as what you see in the, the photographs here. So if you want something that you can interact with people, board games, and there are quite a few, and obviously other people are going to start making things. Imagine, and we're going to talk about it a little later, but Star Wars in your living room. That's where we're at now. So on that note, you know, I really appreciate your time, and uh, I hope to, to have you back on maybe with a more lengthy interview as your Kickstarter winds down. Uh, but it looks like a really exciting product, and uh, like I said, this will be up in the show notes. So we'll have a link out to your your new video that you just put on YouTube, which is a higher quality, so that you can see it again. So again, I appreciate it, Drew, for coming on, and thank you for your time. You're welcome to stay on and listen to the rest of the show, but uh, we're all busy, so you're not hurting me if you you depart. So on that note, I'm going to move into the next item, and that's with Steve. Now I met Steve two days ago at all. We had a small booth in the back of the, the unit, but you know what? He's the one that left me with a, a lasting impress, uh, impression uh, with a little product, and I'm actually going to jump to it right now. And this little thing is Go4D. And actually, there's a little bit more to that. Is that right, Steve? It's Go4D 1C glasses or something like that. C1, What's the full C1 name? C1 glass. C1 glass. Yeah. But yeah. I've got it actually attached to a, an iPhone 6 with my own case design uh, with the structure sensor. So I have kind of like an opera experience, and we're actually going to talk about that a little bit later. But I'll show you how easily this thing detaches. Now, you thought, oh, I'm not going to get into VR experience because I'm going to have to wear goggles. Well, no, it looks like Steve had the right idea. These, they fold up. You can put them in your pocket. Here we go. And they're always with you. And if you want a VR experience, you just pull them out. Now, Steve, you're ingenious because what did you do with this? You allowed some interocular distance changes. Believe it or not, the earlier versions of the Oculus Rift did not have that. So look at that. 
an item. Can I mention the price? Twenty-two dollars. Is that correct, Steve? Yes, of course. Twenty-two dollars with interocular spacing adjustment. Well, that's pretty cool. And if you notice here, it, it's made out of a nice, durable plastic. Um, and I found that these have some springs and elasticity, so that they'll fit around not only my iPhone six, but they fit around my Note four. And look how quickly. Now I have a VR experience. So if I get tired of the real world, I can always go into the virtual world. And that's what really where we're going, right? Everybody's read Ready Play One, or is that, is that the right? Ready Player One. There we go. If you haven't, good book, but it's also frightening because that's where we're going. So I'm going to pull up your, um, your web page here. And uh, so this is the, you've actually got a couple of products. Uh, one of them is the C1 glass, and then you have another product called the Go 4D VR, which you didn't actually have at the show, uh, which looks no. pretty interesting. And then I see the C1 glass WWGC twin. Is that just two pairs for the same shipping price, or is there something special about that? Yeah, two pairs and uh, free shipping, so uh, you can ah. the same, you know, shipping okay. cost. Okay. Well. As, as I mentioned, I really think this is good. If you have uh, anything else to mention about this that I should know about, like I said, it's, it's pretty, you know, sometimes the, the greatest devices are the simplest, and obviously you caught fire on this. I noticed a lot of people coming out with one of these out of your booth, so I don't know how many you sold, but I have a feeling that a lot of people who went there came away with one. I know I came away with two. Brian, if you're out there listening in New York, yours will be coming soon. Uh, he's my New York VR producer that comes on on regularly. Right now he's taking care of his cat, but uh, uh, who's got kidney problems, so I understand why he can't be here. But uh, is there anything else you want to talk about this? Um, yeah, well, let me just introduce a little bit more about my company. Okay. And uh, because yeah, we're based uh, uh, in uh, Korea, South Korea, manufacturing these uh, glasses and the goggles, mainly in Korea. And uh, the company name is the Google Pack, and and uh, we recently have the uh, Google's uh, certified uh, uh, works with the Google Cardboard. So it's uh, well, able that's right. uh, I didn't mention it. Scan the, this QR code, then uh -huh. all Google Cardboard uh, apps will be uh, automatically calibrated to our like a C1 glass. Oh. So, so yeah, on the iPhone or uh, uh, Note 4 or you know because I mean, they are very very different uh, four inch to six inch uh, display sizes. So the uh, works with the Google WWGC Google Cardboard uh, badge means it certifies that like uh, this uh, uh, works very well with the Google's app and all the uh, Google uh, VR team. Is working also with uh, our glasses. So I, I, well, I can I, imagine. I, you, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, like I said, I'm a developer as well, and you know, a lot of times it's kind of a pain to put the goggles on, especially if you're you're interacting with something and testing it. So now I don't need to do that. I just pop these in, look at the experience, and immediately go back to it. So, yeah. well, Tech is about like uh, established uh, 2013 in Korea. It's about okay. almost the three years we've been uh, concentrating on this. Uh, the reason I actually made this is uh, I've been doing the robotics and the computer science major, okay. and I always okay. want to have the like a uh, head mount set or you know VR thing. You know, it's like an old a dream. You know, in, in this area, people mm -hmm. have been you know trying to make. But I mean, uh, uh, when the display goes uh, higher resolution, and and I want to have a very cheap and very uh, reliable prices that everybody uh, in the world can have uh, uh, some uh, uh, feel of a virtual reality. So I come up with uh, these ideas. So simple and, and very low price, so every can, everybody can afford it, and, and and very easy. And even the, from the kids to like a very old people, 70, 80 people, they uh, they years old. I mean, they they really love uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, glasses, and, and know, that's why I concentrated on this lens. The essence of this uh, uh, um, glasses, uh, the lens, it has to be perfect for the human eye and variety of different uh, people. So that's why uh, we patented these uh, 
uh, uh, IPD and the distance and the mm -hmm. astral lenses to make sure uh, if pe people don't get sick. And I tested the, before I launched it in Korea, I tested uh, more than 20,000 people uh, to see uh, whether it's okay for like a six months period of time. Mm -hmm. And nobody claimed and that they, they feel uh, very clean and uh, they see very well. That's why even the character C means like what you see. See, the first <laughs> the C1 glass is the uh, name of that. But like in, in, uh, in America, we reintroduced uh, this year, uh, uh, 2015, from the SES uh, 2015 in Las Vegas. And we established a company called the Go4D Technology, which distributes all our products all over the world from America. And then um, we have uh, several patents on the uh, glasses. And even as you, as you saw, uh, we have uh, like a head mount set we produce. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, and, and you can also put the smartphone inside here in the cartridge. And you just uh, uh, slide it in, uh, any, any type of it. And then uh, you can uh, have the things, and then you can strip like this. And also, now this thing... you can see this? Uh-huh, that's, that's like, uh, OK. This one doesn't touch your face. I don't like you know, all the like uh, current VR gears. Oh. They mm -hmm. touch your face. And then while after like a couple minutes, you know, it's very hard to watch it because it, it pressures and it sweats and you know, inside the, the lens is like uh, foggy like that. So I want to have the uh, uh, this one to be as you see. I don't know whether you can see it. It doesn't touch at all. Yeah, right. Now, so, obviously, I found with your even with your little um, go for the C1 glass that yeah. uh, a lot of people say, well, how can they work very well because you don't have it fully enclosed? But I found that you don't really need that. So I was going to tell you, you said, well, don't you need that foam touching around yours to, the, to seal off the light? And I'm assuming that you really don't need that either. And then yeah, my... And also, also like, uh, it's better to see some light from the outside. Even, even you go to the theater, it's not completely dark. You see the, some lights and the staircases like that. That doesn't make uh, people dizzy. Right. And that, that's a very good point. With these, because you still have your external cues, um, you, yeah. you still have your vestibular balance. And I have found that, that this really works well with that. Now, in my own yeah. case, I had a couple of people who have never done VR yesterday use these, and they were fascinated. And I think mm -hmm. this is a good introduction because they don't have to put anything on their head. They don't have the fear of falling over. And like you said, they don't get sick. And as you know, when we use my product, because it also maps the outside world, I have found that if you have full body interaction, that you have no sickness either, even with a goggle. So I think we're really on to something here. You've got a great little product. Um, so what is the price of your goggles? Because I'd like to try those out as well. And then my other question is... Uh, one is uh, 100, 100 bucks. Okay. Okay, so it's like... And I'm going to compare it to another product out there that I bought, and I wish I hadn't, called the VR1, um, which is kind of similar to that. They use a cartridge system, but it conforms only, you know, at the time that I purchased it, to two different phones. You seem mm -hmm. to indicate a lot of phones. How do you hold them in tightly so they don't... Yeah. Note 4 or uh, iPhone 6 Plus, even, uh, you know, like a L, uh, Galaxy versions from 4 uh -huh. to... Uh, uh, six inches. So up to well, how the. How does it? Yes. How does it hold it in the tray? I mean, it. Okay. Uh, uh, it's like tray, tray is like this, and uh -huh. it comes to with, with like, like a sponge. It puts mount oh. top, top and bottom. So okay. It will adjust it, and the uh, the phone goes inside of the sponge. So we gotcha. give uh, several different kinds of sponge, and it comes with like a two. Two kind of cartridge that's oh, for the okay. real big one, and then like a small to uh, like a, a LG G3 size up to this one is up to LG G3 size, and another one is uh, like a Note 4 and 6 Plus. You know, okay. it will uh, accept it, and and it's 
it's not universal or like uh, you know because I mean if it goes like uh, too much too many uh, adjustable things I mean it's very difficult to uh, uh, view it so we want to make a uh, simple not too much mechanics uh, people can uh, look at it but the more important thing is like uh, uh, our field of view mono field of view is about like a 60 degrees mm -hmm. each one when you see the like a uh, uh, Binocular uh, field of view or diagonal is about like 85 field of view, 85 okay. degrees. And then you can uh, interpopulate the uh, distance, the IPD is mm -hmm. about like a 50 to 75 because the kits are like, uh, you know, 50 millimeter like this. But like uh, women's are like a 60 and men average is a 65. And like, uh, you know, like a people who have very flat faces that mm -hmm. may be 75 in like a human humanity you know so, <laughs> well uh, but the point is you provided some flexibility and I have noticed with uh, since I've also designed one of the things that you may have noticed with the sensor let me go back to my major screen here yeah, yeah. For a moment uh, if if you noticed on this design the the scanner head fits outside of it so I've had to look for a a headset that I can adapt to it. So I have a special plate for the Humado um, headset because it's the only one that I can work with. But when I found yours, it doesn't interfere with any of that because the lens fits yeah, right yeah, behind it. I, I saw, so, so your, your invention, and I was so surprised. You're a genius, really, you know, oh, no. to, to, into, to become no. a really, you know, complicated, uh, very good uh, uh, gears. Well, this actually, as we are talking about, and I'll let the the audience know. One, do you have maybe uh, a, a a special discount price for any of my audience members if they say all things 3D? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely okay. give you a good discount. And the other and thing, um, to give myself a little bit of a self promotion, if you buy the Neody Mount case, I'm going to be working with Steve and uh, purchasing some and uh, including at it uh, for probably at cost so that uh, you'll get the case and a pair of goggles since mostly you're buying this to get the sensor you'll have a full VR experience uh, that nobody nobody has even though Project Tango has showed some examples of it that's with a big faceplate uh, nobody has something that is this small that you can run around like an opera. Yeah, we already uh, discussed it with my colleagues and staff I mean, we are really waiting for all your package really yeah, well, I'll, we'll stay in touch, and uh, Steve, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, like I said, I think you were the thing that was most memorable for me there uh, because it's very simple, very elegant, and low cost, and that's really important in this market. And even though, and that's one of the reasons why Google Cardboard caught on so quickly because it's just yes. cardboard, but cardboard is still bulky. Yeah, not these little things. These things, they can fit in your pocket. In fact, they yeah. come with a little glass case. Um, yeah. So, thank you, Steve. Yeah. I appreciate okay. your time. So, uh, some people hold like this, <laughs> so it's very yeah. easy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for you know showing. Thank this, you, Steve. Uh, I really appreciate it, and we'll stay in touch. Yeah. And then, if you got any other products that uh, you're going to be coming out with, don't hesitate to let me know, right. and I'll make sure that they get on the show. And uh, yeah, like I said, I saw them at awe, and they were awesome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Talk to you later. Bye. Okay. Bye. Well, that was Steve, and actually, uh, Steve was well. He's a very cheerful guy. I really appreciate him. He was all smiles the whole time uh, when I brought over my my Neody VR system to him and had those uh, lenses I just bought the day before. Uh, I was so excited I had to show him. He took the unit and people, he'd stop and say, hey, you got to look at this. So I thought it was really cool. So, James, hello. Hey, how's it going? I've made it today. Um, I, I finally did. Yeah, I actually had a couple things I had to do today, which made me even later, but uh, I'm here now. Yep. So we'll get to you in a moment. I'm still finishing up some news items, and then uh, Chris is also running late. Uh, so I've been kind of hosting this all by myself, but I've had some great guests. I've had Steve, and uh, I've also had uh, Drew from a very interesting company called H Plus Technologies, who has kind of like a holodeck. You remember the the item in uh, uh, Star Wars where Princess Leia? They've got something like that, and it's very reasonably priced. It's like five hundred dollars. You can have like multiple people surrounding it, so 
If you didn't see it, James, go back and take a look at it or look at some of the links in show notes. Uh, I think it's pretty exciting. So, uh, so I've kept busy without you guys this morning. Right. Uh, so it, uh, actually, it probably was better because I got through some of the items. So I'm going to wait till Chris gets back with his items, and then I'm going to move more into some of the other things. We just talked about uh, the motion holography system by Holus or called Holus. So let's get into some of the uh, some other products that I saw that were kind of interesting uh, in the news. You know, we do have a scanner darkly where we talk about scanners, and as you know, I develop for the structure sensor. But I saw this in the news, and I thought to myself, wow, this is really interesting. And what I found out that, that uh, as most of you are aware of, Apple bought the PrimeSense sensor, so they've kind of put a halt to anybody using that sensor. So people are going to two different companies, Soft Kinetics and uh, the Intel's RealSense. And I have just signed up for the developer kit as well when I went out to the show and had a talk with them. $99, and that would get you their sensor. Now, a lot of people complain that their SDK is a little more complicated uh, to, uh, versus, let's say, the Android uh, uh, Project Tango system or even the, uh, the occipital structure sensor. But I think they're improving it. And I don't know how much it will actually cost to get one of these to incorporate it into a design. But it appears that many people are working with it. They've had two different versions. They've had, they're both the, the S200 and I think the R200. And the R200 allows you to do external scanning. And this goes, it's the outward facing camera. And uh, what they're saying here is that this was uh, introduced into this scanner and it would provide an accuracy of one millimeter with a two meter cube uh, maximum scanning volume down to a 10 centimeter. Now that's really interesting because the structure sensor, even with my lens system, is only capable of 30 centimeters. Uh, so we've got something that actually can go even further down. So it'll be really interesting to see how well this item can scan. It has a 1080p camera. That's where the strength of the structure sensor and the iPhone comes in. Uh, you have something that's actually close to 4K quality and not just 1080p for your textures. Uh, but uh, some of the images I saw on another page, and actually I'll go out to it, uh, actually directly out to it. It's funny. One of the last things here is, oh, this is interesting because the pricing looks really good. It's only like $299, uh, which is a little less than getting the structure sensor. But the other caveat to remember is that this is made more or less for the desktop. I don't know if they have Android uh, software for it. So you have to tag it to a laptop or a desktop unit, which you can do with the structure sensor as well. But the problem with it is no longer mobile. And uh, obviously, your, your choices on what it can be used for are limited. Uh, and it doesn't indicate that it is wireless, just mobile. In fact, uh, some of the images on their own website, which I'll jump to, uh, and I don't do, do you know what uh, that uh, that the, the Intel uh, camera was on that last page? It's called the Intel Real Sense. Hmm. Okay. It, do you know anything about it? Yes, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. It uh, it is a a either a time of flight or a structured sensor, just like the other two that they have. They're comparing here, uh, but it's Intel's derivative of it. And from what I've heard earlier, the accuracy wasn't very good, so they've come up with a new version uh, that's very slimline, that's, like I said, outgoing, which also expands the volume that it can scan. Uh, some of the examples I've seen seem pretty interesting, uh, but here they compare the 3D system sense, which is the handheld, and then obviously the structure sensor or the 3D system eye sense. I don't know why they didn't identify occipital, the structure sensor, but... Uh, which is the one that attaches to the iPad. And it gives you the different variances, like you have a larger volume, uh, but the minimal size, they show 0.2. Yes, it can go down to that, but I found that without my lens system, that's kind of an artificial barrier. In order to actually get that clarity, you have to have a better lens. So I was thinking, well, maybe there were a prime sense uh, scanner, but no, they're a real sense. And they say they're capable of going down to 0.1 meters or 10 centimeters. Um, so we'll see if that's the case. The actual accuracy is one millimeter. With my lens system on the structure sensor, it's actually a little less than that now. It's like 500 to 600 microns. Um, it's a little more noisy, but uh, you can push it a little lower. And then uh, they show you the price comparison. The iSense 
is 499. However, the occipital structure sensor is only 375. So it's not that much more than theirs. And obviously, 3D system has inflated the price on the iSense. Uh, but you can go out to occipital and get their structure sensor for $375. And again, that was confirmed again at all when I did the interview with them. The other thing that's important, and we'll talk about it later, I think the structure sensor has a lot more versatility, and we're going to talk about one of those versatilities that was big at all this year. Uh, so there it is. Looks like it comes in multiple colors. The other caveat is it says it won't be available to spring 2016, uh, which is probably why you don't see it on anything other than their own site. So if that's true, we still have a long way off, and then all of obviously your Decision making is narrowed down to the 3D system sense, eye sense, or the occipital structure sensor, or the Artec scanners, which are much more pricier. And other than that, I don't really think there's anything else out there yet. So that's something coming up. So let's kind of move on into the VR corner. Well, the VR corner for me is uh, pretty exciting. Why? One, I was at awe, and I spent two days there covering all kinds of things, both augmented reality and uh, virtual reality. And uh, there is a lot of occipital there. I'm not sorry. Well, obviously, occipital was there. I was working with them, but also Oculus. Lots of things people are using Oculus for. But guess what they came out with? They finally did their press release, and they introduced yesterday. And luckily, I was online when it all came out because I was able to do some tweeting was the uh let's see why we there we go let it go through they uh yeah we'll go right to it. the rift and this is the rift um kind of an interesting device it looks pretty similar to the previous version in front they have now put an ipd uh, distance modifier right there in the bottom which has never been available on their previous uh, uh headsets now you're, and now what that is, that's your interocular distance between your eyes, which is important to get the proper for a focus and not have a headache. Hi, Chris. Let me finish up on the Rift, and then uh, we'll say hi to you. Hey. You. So the, uh, as you know, Chris, uh, the Rift was introduced yesterday. So I had actually tweeted a few times and talked about it. That was our introduction video today. Was the Rift introduction, and uh, it looks like a really nice device. And uh, here they've actually modified the little thing that you put on the top of your laptop into a more elegant uh, kind of a sensor. Uh, James, if you're not aware of it, they use this as kind of a camera, and there's infrared uh, imaging devices inside the, uh, the VR thing. And you can't see my cursor, but it, they're on the inside the front panel of it. Um, and what it does is it maps that out on this image sensor so that you know where you're at in space. Now, obviously, it's not the same thing that Neo DVR does, but uh, it does allow you to move around, move close, back and forth. Chris, did you ever try mine, the DK2? Uh, uh, yes. Yes, I did. So that does add a little bit more. You can move your head, bob it up and down, look around corners. So it adds much more immersion than the original DK1. And then... Uh, this is the backing, so they've gone to a different backing style, so it's not just a elastic band, it actually is a plastic support system. Uh, so again, it will minimize the, the pull on the front of the face, so I kind of like that. And then they have some illustrations of some of the technology. These are the, not the sensors, but the emitters in the, the cowl that I was just talking about without the cover on it. And then they actually have built-in earpieces now. So. And as we've talked about before, there are many companies, and I covered one at AWE, that are doing 3D uh, sound projection, and they're including it in their SDK. So you get that full sound projection in 3D as well as the stereoscopic uh, 3D system in the lens system. So overall, I think it's kind of a cool thing. This was another big surprise. They're throwing in the, the Xbox One wireless controller in this kit. And also, from what I've heard, Microsoft has a deal to start streaming to the PC and Xbox One games. So you'll be able to experience those in VR. Uh, then they came out with this. And if you saw my tweet, and I'm going to make a point, and I've got a point later on to talk about it. You know, I've not been a very big fan of the <laughs> Six Sense STEM system that I invested money in, that they've had a lot of excuses why they hadn't had it out. I kind of said, we've kind of sealed 
the nail on the coffin with this. So this is what uh, Oculus has introduced. It's two sensors. They're wireless. You put them in your hands. They have joystick controls on them. More importantly, again, see the emitters here. So it can follow these in space as well. So you can move your arms around. In fact, the example that Lucky Palmer had on stage is that he pulled the robot's arms apart. So you can literally use them to, to interact with objects like hands. And obviously that was the big thing STEM was about, uh, was able to do that. So it'll be very interesting. STEM, like I said, and I, I'll talk about it a little later. I had an interview with them. Uh, still doesn't look like they're going to have anything till the end of the year. And obviously there have been a lot of upset people. Other people are coming out with things. Obviously Oculus may have been waiting, maybe not. But this looks like a really slick thing. Who knows what the price is, um, but it does look slick. Here's some examples of it being used. Uh, and then, obviously, without content, content none of this yeah. matters. And right. people have been really raving about E Valkyrie. And uh, obviously, I think I should try that. And obviously, you know, I've looked at a lot of the developer stuff, and I think it's really progressing. We're now getting content with narrative, uh, with actual gaming content, not just demos, uh, and, and uh, obviously that's going to be very important. Right. So yes, I think uh, this is going to be exciting. Sad thing is, and I don't understand it, why are they waiting to introduce this first quarter of 2016? It makes no sense. This seems like a great Christmas gift, and I don't understand that. So there must be some you know, technical complication or supply complication that's preventing that, but uh, at least it's here. That, I guess that. Now I thought, well, maybe they're waiting to a 4K screen. It doesn't appear that's the case. It looks like it's going to be still a 2160 or uh, 1080p uh, per screen. They say it's too individual. I think it's still again one screen that's just segmented into two. Uh, it will be 2160, I believe, by 1200. And uh, so, if you're familiar with the Note 4. That's about the quality of the screen you're going to get. But they say the important reason for doing that is because in order to get 90 frames per second and stereo projection, which means you have to have two images, you need like 240 to 400 frames per second uh, or pixels, uh, megapixels per second or something like that. So you have to push a lot. So if you look at the, um, and there's the back of it, kind of looks like Siobhan from the back, but uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, if you take the, uh, what it takes to move that number of pixels, uh, this is one of the reasons, and again, a little bit of controversy, you need about a $1,500 gaming machine to do it properly. Uh, you could probably get by with a lesser machine, uh, but I have a feeling about $800, $1,000 will get you a pretty good machine to run this thing. So save your pennies if you don't have that kind of machine now. The other sad thing is the latest SDK does not support Mac. And that some people are in uproar about that, but from what I've gathered, until they probably make a deal with Metal, which is one of the things that was announced at WWC, the OpenGL just has been suffering for a great graphics thing. Um, so that like it's been like launch items after launch items. So yeah, yeah, yeah. This week and next, uh, we've got we've got E3, E3. coming up. So let me move right into the next item, and then I'll let you take over your two news items, it's, Chris. It's and like then... my favorite time of year, Mike. <laughs> okay, so next item is Phobe. I saw them today, and here's another lens that, again, a plastic cowl that goes over the head. Now, what makes this very interesting? One, the cost is very reasonable. Uh, I think it's like 275 but it uses pupil tracking. So you can literally move your eyes around, and it allows you to track the object. So here they show an example uh, behind me here. And, uh, and then here's another one. See how they're positioning the eyes. And then they have something, and I've been reading about it uh, from a technical person called foveate rendering, which means as you move your eyes, you focus on it. And that's what we right. do naturally. But in a game, everything's always in focus. But this allows us to concentrate on a particular area because it tracks the, uh, the pupils of the eye. And more importantly, it allows you to, and I can't think of the term now, uh, which accelerates or um, provides more detail or mesh detail where your eyes are pointed and the rest of it takes less mesh detail so that your performance is improved. And it's something that also a occipital has been looking, not a occipital. Uh, well, and I could see it being more natural, too. I could see it feeling more natural, like, inside a game. I uh, actually there's a uh, 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 probably about a year ago I, I I saw a video of the game Quake, and they were using this eye tech 
uh, eye track technology, and uh, it, it was really precise. They they use uh, infrared to track the eyes. They yeah, actually that's use, what they do uh, here. Yeah, if you actually go out and look at the uh, the um, the videos that I I shot out at all, especially in the VR section, I actually talked to those people, James. Uh, they're a German company, and that system, even though it's a great demo, is very expensive. And they're looking at uh, obviously commercializing. It's like twenty thousand dollars, but they're looking at bringing it to the consumer market and working with Oculus. So we may see that sooner than later. Don't they use this uh, same technology in the uh, uh, the Gunner uh, uh, airplanes, where they they look with their eyes and then they can fire? Yep, that's what he said, is that it's had military applications as well as other civilian, but it's costly, uh, which is kind of funny because I just got finished talking to these guys. For 275 you get something like that, and then he tells me it's $20,000 for theirs, and I'm thinking, okay, yeah. what, are we, what are we doing differently here? So it's real interesting. Um, they still have them available. Let's see where we're at, uh, or do they? Hmm. Is that okay? Yeah. So 399, you get the faux VR headset. Uh, yeah, there. So there are still some left at 399. So I guess the oh, sorry, there's still some left at 375, like this she told me. So if you want to get the faux earlier um, early bird version, they're still there. Um, don't feel like you have to support them. Well, I guess you should, but they have already exceeded their backing. They did that like in the first three days, so obviously some people think it's interesting. Good so we've them. got two companies today. Um, the Hullis, which you missed earlier, uh, I'll jump back to it, was the interactive uh, pyramid system that has like a hologram. Uh, that immediately uh, broke its Kickstarter. And then this one over here. So that's pretty much all my VR. Well, I've got one more for Brian, but I'll tell you what. We'll take a break from VR, and then we'll head right into Chris. Hey, Chris. Hey all! Last day of school in Paso Robles today. A lot of lot going on uh, here, and like Mike was saying, uh, pretty awesome uh, week. Next couple weeks, uh, we had let's see uh, the Apple Developer Conference. Always is pretty fun. They open sourced Swift, you know. So we'll just we'll just throw that in there. That's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, and then like you were mentioning, Metal, which is uh, basically an alternative. That's Apple's new solution to OpenGL and the yeah, problem. Yeah, I think with DirectX. OpenGL. DirectX in the Microsoft world, this is their equivalent. Uh, Metal has already been on iOS, so I'm familiar with it there. But yeah, it works. It is their API to work directly with the hardware. Um, from what I've heard from others, the OpenGL libraries that they were using just didn't perform very well. And people have done some comparison. It was like four times slower than the Windows equivalent. So you know, as you know, a lot of the Macs can be converted. I think, um, James, that you're able, you're able in fact, you have a Mac that you're doing that using Boot Camp with, if I remember correctly. So uh, yeah, yeah I've, I've got some heartache with uh, with Apple on that one, but uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> but uh, yeah. so Boot Camp so, has allowed you to get better performance, and I guess they've recognized that and brought it to the the Mac OS system. Right, right, right. So so that you know, and then and then we've got you know next week we've got Nintendo. This is just like it's like Christmas time for me. It's like my favorite time of year. Is uh, you know these first few weeks of June, so um, yeah. So so first, I'll uh, I can get into um, uh, one of my news items um, real quick. We can go over uh, Talman Company has partnered with um, the same company uh, that partnered with. Um, I'm trying to remember the the name of the company that makes the uh, the filament with uh, Eastman Amphora, Eastman oh, Code okay. Kodak. Yeah, so we talked about them a lot. Yeah, so, um, and I actually have used some of that filament. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the filament. Uh, Polymaker? No, not Polymaker. It's... Uh, no, Polymaker is one I'm going to cover later on. Yeah, and, and so, uh, anyways, uh, Talman 3D, who it brings us uh, 3D, 3D print filaments uh, that are nylon, all these specialty filaments, um, and they're, they're known for their kind of their QC, their quality control. They uh, they have partnered with Eastman Amphora on a new uh, Envent uh, polymer for 3D printing, and so it's uh, low odor, styrene free, and it's uniquely suited for 3D printing applications. They say so. 
Um, pretty much everything Talman puts out is 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 um, you know there's a lot of QC that goes on on their end. They're definitely chemical uh, experts, and so uh, yeah, I'm really excited to uh, kind of try this stuff out. So they're they're claiming that it's it's uh, you know got a lot of clarity in gloss, dimensional stability, which is really good for engineering applications, uh, ease of processing. So it'll print really nice, um, and it's low odor. So uh, we'll uh, it, it hopefully will be a HIPS alternative that might be a little bit stronger. So the same proper property retention in 3D applications. So hopefully it'll be like easy to print like HIPS is. But um, so this dissolves? Uh, no, it doesn't say anything about dissolvability. It doesn't. Yeah, say I don't anything. think it's a dissolvable. I don't think it's a dissolvable. But it. Uh, but it's just kind of a new uh, Eastman Amphora. Uh, uh, makes that. Let me. You know, I can actually look it up. It's on Matter Matter Hackers. So will, it. will it stick to the bed? That's that's, that's so that's that's <laughs> another that's another main one that. Uh, that's you know, what I'm battling of, with right now, Chris. Is getting stuff uh, to stick to the bed. Okay. Well, I've got some tips for you then. Great. And great. yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, and and we can get into that in the in the print yeah. whisper. I could I can go over that again. Um, so. So that that's kind of first news item, and um, real quick we could run into. Uh, let me see here. Let's pull up this next one. I just saw this. This one was pretty cool. Um, I I figured I'd share this. Is just a little five-axis 3D printer um, that I that's went online on YouTube. So oh. this is uh, by a five-axis maker. So here you can see in the video if you're if you're watching on screen. Um, so it's a five-axis. It looks like he's running some like an E3D or you know similar hot end, and he's basically printing the continents on on a, the face of a globe. So he printed the underlying globe, and then he's printing the continents on top of it, on top of a sphere using five-axis methods. So it's so, kind of a cool. Yeah, it's cool, but the application. Yeah, is it necessary? What what's the yeah yeah there? so 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 if you think about it, well, it it's like any auxil it's like any technology like this, right? It's going to have auxiliary technologies that spin off of it. But the biggest the biggest one that I see um, with this is being able. So if you think about three D printing today, when you're print you print essentially like wood grain, and so there's weak spots in every print that you print. So when you print in the Z direction. Um, like if you have snap hook hinges or things like that, you want to orient your part so that it's as strong as possible depending on the application. And a lot of times you have to sacrifice that so that you can even get, you know, be able to print a part. Well, with this method, you can orient the nozzle in a way that you can actually make cross patterns like they are with this globe, for instance, where the weakness of the part, so, so what he's done is he's built, he, this, this person has built this globe in the Z direction, and then if you go over the face of it, that in you know without building in the Z direction, you're all over the place. You're actually uh, adding a lot of strength to parts. So this would be a method that you could use to build a lot stronger parts that don't have weak areas. Um, that's just one of the benefits I could see. Um, yeah, not now to mention. Did, yeah, go ahead. Now, did this printer also create the globe? So it just used a fixed axis and then printed normally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well, a, a five-axis. Yeah, exactly. It's a five-axis printer. Uh, it, it can print just the same as a three-axis or a four-axis. It just yeah, has another ability, abil abil another degree of freedom in its, uh, you know, in its ability to articulate. So. Yeah, and most printers have three axes: X, Y, and the Z. And then a four has, um, let's see, pitch, and then five is a roll or something like that. Uh, so they can move this way and then this way. If I remember, yaw or pitch, I can't remember exactly. But uh, so that's and a lot of CNCs apply that uh, process, if I remember correctly. Do you, you think I thought the, be, do you think the software is going to take a long time to come out for something like that? It seems kind of well, complex. Well, so it's going to be similar to CAM software now. So that's like mm -hmm. it, it, this is more of like a tool that would be in the hands of a machinist, somebody that knows how to program a CNC. Um, so uh, the slicing software obviously hasn't been super developed, but I'm sure it looks like this person, it had, you know, kind of homebrewed some G code 
um, for this for their particular this particular print. Um, but yeah, uh, there is CAM software out there to define toolpaths, and um, you know I'm sure people are already hard at work. I've seen other five-axis 3D printers, but this one was the first one that I've seen that's FFF uh, style, uh, just you know squeezing and printing on the face of an existing 3D print or a print that it did building in the Z direction. Yeah, and James, uh, Fusion 360 also does CAM output now, so uh, you already have a tool that will be able to do that. Uh, one other question or point on that is that because it's a multi-axis system, five axis, you could replace that print head with an inkjet paint system. So you could actually hmm. map in the, a texture. And I think there's another company that's actually doing something similar to that, but I could see something like, in fact, I had thought about doing something like that. So I'm glad. I did notice that they had a standard, standard NEMA 17 hanging off of that. That must be pretty heavy. Uh, so it's probably, well, probably doesn't work very quickly, but uh, the fact that you can do five axes is kind of cool. So I'm glad you kind of brought in some real 3D printer stuff because, you know, we've been in the VR world a lot. All right, let me jump back into... <laughs> There's been a lot of VR going on, so, you know, and that's Okay, that's well, 3D I think we're all going to be excited about this, so let me launch this because who, who isn't a... Ready? I think when you get a room full of creatives from movies and video games and just the technical sector what we've got and you get them all in the same space you're going to create something pretty exciting. Thanks to the coming of a new generation of Star Wars films, ILM, Skywalker Sound and Lucasfilm itself are engaged in the creation and expansion of a universe on a scale that's never been seen before. We've been creating virtual worlds for a long time, but when you can actually see it in front of you in real time and interact with it, to grab an iPad and drag around on the screen and instantly see the results of your creative decision, it completely changes the kinds of experiences we can make. We're starting to push the envelope on what we think is possible to be shown in a real-time environment. We're entering a, an age of immersive entertainment where it is possible to collapse the walls that separate us from story experiences. Imagine you are watching a scene, but then you were able to pass through the invisible wall that seems to separate you from that movie. You can go further into the world in which the story is taking place. No one really knows how audiences are going to experience virtual reality and augmented reality and immersive cinema, but I do know that we have the most expansive universe to explore in Star Wars. The trick is figuring out what storytelling looks like in that space, and part of what I'm excited about that's going on here is we're being afforded the opportunity to ask ourselves that question and explore that together. We've created XLab as a place where we combine the story department inside Lucasfilm, ILM, Skywalker Sound, and the technology available to us to create experiential entertainment. The mission of ILM XLab is to create completely new experiences. We're actually opening our doors now for the first time for experienced creators to collaborate with us. I think we are experiencing a renaissance with experiential storytelling. That's something that in a way George did with the first Star Wars. He recognized that storytelling and technological innovation go hand in hand and that's something that as a company we're uniquely suited to do. Ah, wasn't beautiful. that cool? It's a beautiful I, thing. I saw a little product in there Kind of look like this thing right here. I don't know. <laughs> look like a structure sensor. Look like right. they were pointing at things. They were using the unstructured uh, <laughs> moving system. Hmm. What didn't they tell me yet? I actually just sent them an, a link that that go check out the latest Star Wars. They'll probably come back. Yeah, we know. But uh, pretty cool, huh? I can't wait. This Very is just cool. awesome. Earlier we covered the game, the Grim World. Now you'll be able to actually experience it, and those characters look like you could just go out and touch them. Yeah. And yeah. this 
Is this Christmas? Did we just uh, step into Christmas? I, I, I think know. we're I think one. St- I think we're one step away from the, you know from the chairs on uh, what was the movie Wally or whatever when they're uh, plugged in. <laughs> you know <laughs> what? I apologize to my audience, and I'll make sure the link is in there so you can go experience it. But I don't know how I can do it. But I guess you all saw the video, right? Mm-hmm. You all. Yeah. yeah. Our audience didn't because I didn't switch my screen, and I, so. Let me try that. I'm going to click Chris. What do you guys do? You guys see anything like is he does he have a silhouette around him or is he highlighted? No, you your video is up for us. No, I know, but the audience, what do you see on your end right now for your you. little box down there? Oh, I see myself. Which item is highlighted though? None of them are highlighted. Okay, so when on my end right now, I see myself as highlighted, and James, you're blown out for whatever reason. You're like white. <laughs> yeah, I've been messing with my camera, so. Uh, okay, we'll have to talk about <laughs> that. But uh, we have to figure out because if I don't pay attention to it, when you go out to the YouTube, that whole video that we just showed, nobody saw. So I'm I hope so. Probably cut it out. No, I know. What you you hope nobody saw it? No, I hope so. I hope it is up. I, I, I'm hey, pretty well, sure. Okay, well, I hope so too. But I was looking on my end, and if I don't see my own big face in front of me, that means they're not seeing my big face in front of me. So again, uh, I apologize, guys, um, for not having that in there. I'll probably go in and cut it out, so I won't. You won't have to bear two minutes of not seeing what we saw, <laughs> which was pretty awesome. So uh, I'll make sure it's in the show notes. Sorry. Uh, all right, I've got to keep ahead of it. So we got to figure out how you guys can know when the master signal is being placed, and maybe it's just my responsibility. Okay, okay well, that was kind of cool. i got one. Actually, I think that's it for me. That was actually Brian's contribution. I think he's got some inside things on uh, what's going out there. But, Chris, you've got something, and this may actually play out to something that we're working with as well. Yeah, yeah, um, and and are we talking? Uh, are you talking uh, the pro- for smart our, one smart gloves? Oh yeah, so uh, that's another. That was another one, and that kind of goes hand in hand. I figured you guys might have already covered this, um, but I will. Not. I will blow it up, and we will talk about it. Um, Glove one. This is an interesting project. Uh, Glove one. So. Hang on a second. Let it uh, feed through. Okay, go ahead and try and talk now. Chris? Chris, did you just die on us? No, I am here. Okay, good. Yeah, um, i Yeah, your voice siloned us on us for a little bit. Okay. Okay. Go so, so uh, this glove one... Hmm, you're you're coming in and out now, and I don't know why. All right. Well, uh, I don't know the uh, things. There we go. Are there, any, are there any videos playing on this Tech Times when you're? Mm-mm. Okay. Well, we'll just tolerate it. Um, worst case is I'll drop it in uh, on my end right now, and then. Uh... So go ahead. There we go. Okay, so it, it, it's basically a glove you can put on, and it uh, it has vibrations that go over the glove and let you feel um, what you're seeing in a game uh, in a virtual reality world. So uh, it's okay, we're losing you again. Article on uh, on TechTimes.com about it, where you can check out uh, the glove one and kind of some of the details that have been released. There's actually a video down here that you can watch as well and kind of give you a little uh, preview, a little glimpse on exactly how it works. Uh, to my knowledge, it's basically vibration is what it is, um, and and that's your feedback is in the form of vibrations that are all over your hand. So I don't really know too much because I haven't actually used it, and I think a lot of it is... Uh, is kind of speculation, but um, yeah, but it seems like a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool idea, and can't wait to see if they uh, pull it off because I'd like to, I'd like to try that out. Sounds kind of fun. Very neat. Uh, I'm trying to look at it now, playing the video on my end. Uh, 
so did they appear to be mobile? And yeah, so they, of, yeah it, it appears to be wireless. Okay, and it appears that they've got a Kickstarter as well, huh? They, ha they do problem. indeed. So let me, I'm going to go out there right now. All right, so it's still going on right now. It's another one that was just launched. Um, so they have 61000 of 150000 And the price for these little babies is how much? Yeah, the glove ones are $170, and they're all gone, and then they jump up to $191. They're still available at $199. Excuse me. Um, actually, this is pretty interesting. Very interesting. Um, I don't know exactly what they do. Hopefully, they're not wired and that they're remote. And like you said, they have sensors built, or not sensors, uh, I want to say transducers, vibrators that provide you that uh, tactile sensation all through them. Uh, yeah, that, and actually, if you've ever done the leap motion, which is kind of cool, imagine it with these gloves. I'm thanks, Chris. Yeah. Like I obviously I don't know why maybe they or maybe not they were at all, but I don't think they were. I didn't see them there. Uh, yeah, that's cool. Man, I'm never going to be able to save any money. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Nine axis sensor fusion, which is cool. That that means that you get full positioning of your hands. And then, uh, obviously, they have a battery built in, so they don't take it from anywhere else. Okay, they do have a USB connection. So, Oh, but they also have Bluetooth. So you can do free movement. You have a built-in battery source. So you basically slip them on, and then they're transparent. Uh, I don't... It will be interesting to see... Okay, so they talk about working with the Intel RealSense. And talks about Microsoft Connect. Uh, I have to send this off to a sip at all because we were talking about that because I don't know if you noticed we can actually sense the hands and actually we're going to do a demo here in a little bit uh, before we head out of, of the Neodi VR system but you can actually track your hands in the system and I thought of just using gloves that are colored uh, but these seem perfect not only do you get the axis motions of your hand themselves um, but you also get stimuli. So what we were talking about is, wouldn't it be neat in some of the demos that we've done that you, you touch something out there and you get some response back? And it looks like, see, Chris, you're a magic man. Chris is a magic man. We were just talking about this, and here it is. And there's still time to spend money on it. Wow. I'm telling know. you, it, I was we were talking about this last night, is... You know, we all, we all, like anything we could think of as kids is here now. Anything you could think of that was an invention when you were a kid is here. And like, so now, we're, here I am, 32 years old. I like, what, do, what can I think of that like 15 years from now that I want and it will be here? So, you know, and like, I want the Iron Man suit. That's what I want. I want to be able to fly in space. Can. And cut some holes in it, and you can be Iron Man. You can be Can Man. I want a real yeah. one with with uh, with the uh, you know, with yeah. the propulsion system and everything. Yeah. yeah. Can, can he do it? Can he do it? Yeah. I'll yeah. tell you what. I'm going to direct us over to something else and get out of the VR until the final item. So I'll wait to the end. But you know, James has been emailing me, emailing me, and pulling his hair out. So he's got less hair now. And notice yeah. he's he's blind with fury. Look at the light in his room. He's he's <laughs> aggravated. And what are you aggravated about? Because you know we have back this week the print whisper. So maybe the two of you can kind of figure out how to get your damn ABS to stick on your belt. Uh, I think I've given up on ABS from the Oh forums. no! Don't give up! Don't give up! <laughs> There's still hope. Everybody says PLA is easier, and I was actually able to get something printed. So. I guess is it my turn to show it's my your turn. I finally got? got something printed. It's my little torrent. It it kind of messed up here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. And then there's the other side. So basically these parts on the sides stay like that and this thing rotates. But trust me, I've been spending the last three or four nights battling with the 3D printer. Um, I think I finally got the actual thing I needed to do, which was to, hold on, let me get the actual wording of it. 
Uh, the supports is one thing, but what did I put on? Oh, a raft. I finally yeah. put a raft because the stuff was so small, it, it, it would just eventually not stick and get pulled away. So the raft is the last print that I w was able to print this with, and I think that is the solution <laughs> to, to making this stuff stick. Well, yeah. one of the things that I mentioned, and Chris can chime in, uh, and pull that apart again. So you printed it as multiple parts. No, I printed it as one part actually. So, but what? It, but you but just, it's able to to come apart. Okay, so, but if you can pull it apart, why didn't you print it as separate parts? Uh, eventually, it won't be like this. This was the first time I actually got it to go through. The next one will actually have these two parts at the end. It'll have a connector that connects it down here to where I can clamp this and actually shoot air through this. So eventually it will not be uh, so so that you can pull well, it apart. You know, this is where I have to agree with Chris. Sometimes if your parts too, are too complicated as a single mm -hmm. unit, they become a burden yep. to the printer because obviously you're just doing layer by layer. And uh, so maybe you, Chris... Um, yeah. So, so first off, because I print a lot of assemblies and a lot of and a lot of piece by piece, and I kind of started. I used to try to print stuff together as one piece. But like we were talking about earlier, is you really st have to start considering that three D printing is a lot like carpentry in the sense that you want to work with the grain and you want to always be considering the direction of the grain uh, for the strength of your parts. So depending on the application, which part it is in your assembly. You want to optimize each part individually and make it so that you can put them together mm -hmm. and, that, and that the overall assembly is going to be as strong as possible. So, you know, a lot of times what, what makes sense is even if that was going to have like a U-shaped connector, you would still make it so that you could disassemble it and you just put a piece of hardware like a small screw yeah. to hold the two together. And that would make it not only easier to print, you would need less support typically you don't uh, uh, if and, and the other thing is is like if you if you, sometimes if, if you print one by one each of those pieces each one might only take uh, you know five or ten or fifteen minutes on to, to print out each one oh. but when your printer has to move from over he, from over one side of the bed to the next and back and it's tr your travel time increases uh, tremendously so Something that might tip if you printed it one by one might take you two hours, but if you printed it all at once, it might take six hours. So, it not only does it defeat you time-wise, but it might defeat you uh, for optimizing it for, uh, for as far as strength and quality of print. So, a lot of times, I I've learned just print each in, each piece individually. Um, you can still print them all on the same build if you want, but typically. If you if you really like time, if it's a time sensitive thing, you might actually be better off building them, uh, you know, one at a time. So that's that's my two cents. Um, and as far as um, getting prints ABS to stick to the bed, um, there's some great documentation on Lulzbot's website about uh, ABS. And one of the things that they do is I can I can sh send you over there. They they actually are the ones that turn me on to this stuff called PET. And PEI are the two uh, two types of uh, um, yeah. So. And this is what I was talking about last night in email, James. Is that I didn't remember the name, but uh, he's obviously he's had a lot of big uh, luck with so it. So here's a for here's a five pack for thirty bucks. This is PET oh. tape, and what this is is this oh. is this goes on your heated bed directly over the glass. You clean your glass, and it's better than Kapton. It's way cheaper than Kapton. And uh, and what so the absolute most important part of getting material ABS or any material to stick to your bed obviously is your first layer height or your first the your first layer mm -hmm. how your Z height how calibrated your printer is uh, you don't want it too squished so that it, the material can't come out of the nozzle and that it's going to distort your print but you also don't want it too far away so that it's not going to adhere to the bed. And the the obviously the biggest ways that you can get things to adhere to the bed is to print a brim would be another thing if you're having a hard time a brim what a brim is is like it's like a hat it's like a 
uh, literally like a brim of a hat. You know, it prints a brim around your print. Like a and it helps it. And so what I do with, with ABS typically, um, with PET, this is not the same as PEI, is I will throw on a little bit of glue stick. Yep, so that's uh, just what I do. <laughs> do some glue stick, and you just have to make sure. And and so and then what? What's the temp that you're running your uh, your bed at? Oh, I think I think I finally settled on 50. Hold on, let me let me bring it up. Uh, so for ABS, you wanted it at about 110. 100. Oh, for ABS, I just printed uh, PLA. That's why it's at. Got I, it. I have it at 40, and then the left extruder 190. And I think on the, the filament, it's said to do it at 210, but I might up it now. I, th I think the big thing was getting that, uh, that uh, raft in there. Yeah, and, and a raft is essentially like, a, like the scaffolding underneath. It's, it's like it makes sure that there's a perfectly level, yeah. uh, but it, it adds a lot of time to your prints, and it, mm -hmm. can also, it can also introduce a whole myriad of other problems. So sometimes a raft is good, but other times um, I try to steer away from it and print a brim instead, and then print my print directly onto the plate. Um, and this, the is build surface. this is why I was asking if it was in multiple pieces. You want to find your flat surfaces, and you want to print your flat surfaces, and then any edges or so forth, because that's why you were having issues, because if you were printing it the way you had showed me, where you had the curve coming up, you have to put the rafters underneath it, otherwise it doesn't stick to the bed because you don't have enough surface area. And that's why I said if you change it to 90 degrees, if you pull the part, ag part again in front of me, James, pull it apart, your, oh. your piece. Okay, just pull them apart so that you have separate pieces. Now, they just no, leave like there. Exactly. And mm -hmm. that, um, for this, me, has... This little hose can actually come out, so I could have probably done it like this, too. Yeah. So that's the way I think about when I create parts, because one, it creates, in my opinion, better structural, but it also creates better ad bed adhesion, and I've always had a lot of luck. So you have to think that way. What are your flattest surface? And as Chris has said, you know, think of the grain, because, you know, the other thing I was talking about is if you have concentric circles where you have continuous feeds of filament, that's going to be a lot stronger than just small sectional pieces when you were trying to print it vertically like that. Um, so these are things that I've learned over the last year, too. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of times, for the longest time, I thought that the temperature of the bed was actually to melt the plastic and keep it <laughs> adhered to the bed. Yeah. That's not, that's not what it is. That's not even why you heat your bed. Uh, with ABS, uh, the typical recommended temperature of like a glass heated bed is 110 C, uh -huh. which is so pretty hot. Yeah, and 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 the reason that you you heat the bed for ABS so hot is not to to adhere the first layers necessarily, but it's it's to keep the the mass of what you're printing at a, an elevated temperature so that it's cooling consistently and not warping as it cools. It's actually it's preventing warping is what the main yeah. the primary reason that you're that you uh, have. It. I mean, obviously bed adhesion is part of it, but the primary reason for ABS for having the temperature so high is so that when you're laying at 240 C, that material is is being laid on something that's not cool. It's it's warm. It's already it's hot, and it's keeping the the mass of your print hot still. And that's why if you're having real bad warping issues, a lot of people build an enclosure this is because then you're mitigating the 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 mass, the temperature of the the mass of your print even further. So that's another. Well, that, yeah. Well, that's one of the advantages of the Flash Forge, which hopefully I'll show us here in a moment. It is fully enclosed. All the sides are enclosed, and then it has... I could probably a, show you on the camera. Hold on. Oh, that's Let's, right. That's right. That's right. He has a Flash so, Forge. And that was my question to you, James. Do you make sure all of those yeah, um, doors and that are closed when you're printing? Yeah, everything then, is closed. Okay. So the other thing that I would do is um, if you don't have a measurement system in there, um, maybe get a little portable thermometer and put it in there so you can read your ambient temperature in there. You may have you know, some leakage or it may be too high. But yeah, Chris is right. You have to have a consistent bed. Even with PLA, it's sometimes better to have some heat than no heat because you stabilize the, the bed so that your part doesn't warp because you don't want parts cooling down before others. Because as you can tell, 
the part, the head has to travel from one location to the other, and there is cooling that goes on during that time frame. So that also creates some problems with uh, fractures and um, weaknesses in parts. And then one other thing that I wanted to mention, and I've already forgotten about it, damn it, um, that Chris kind of, oh, that's kind of sad. Oh, you have a dual head, and I've noticed you immediately tried to print this part. You know, we've talked about 3D Benchy. Download that and utilize that to determine how good you can actually print it because there, that's a reference part. And it's a fun reference part, and that will determine how good you're actually able, your setup is. Uh, if you're just kind of trying to immediately go into a part that you've created, in that case, it's a fairly complex part, uh, you're going to probably run into a lot of issues until you get your whole environment set up. Uh, and the 3D Benchy is excellent because, one, it's a fun little thing that you can give to the kids after you're done printing it. But the other thing is all those things that it does are documented. And there's now, I think, a series on there where they show what happens if certain things come out a certain way and provide you immediate feedback on what you need to be doing to your 3D printer to get it to, to rectify it. Uh, what, so that's what I would recommend. What's the word you're saying? Banshee or bing, Binchy? 3D. Three, numeric 3 Delta Benchy. B-E-N-C-H-Y. And th there's, we talked about them a couple times. You can go back in our previous episodes uh, and bring them up. Uh, they're out of Scandinavia, which was really <laughs> fun. Were you with us, Chris, or were you? Yeah. Uh, did you ever? Yeah, you, you joined yeah us we talked that. to. Him. Yeah. So would you would you agree with that print whisper? Yeah. To, oh, to definitely. The... Yeah, 3D Benchy or um, any calibration tool. Um, probably the first calibration tool I I usually print is just a bed level tool. So one that's nice, the same size as your bed, uh, and it's usually only one, maybe two layers thick, just to see how level you have your bed. So from all, it, what it usually is is like a, uh, an X, and what it's doing is seeing where your high points are and your low points so you can bring different corners up or down so that you can get that, you, because if you don't have a consistent level bed on that first layer, you're, no matter what you try, you will not get good prints. That's the first thing you have to do is get a first, your first level, uh, getting, a, getting your bed perfectly level and getting that first level, that first layer, the perfect height, is that's like that's step it's one. Extremely important. It's well, the, yeah. it's really the only thing that really uh, is the magic in all the three D yeah. printing. The the, the I, height. I, I, the, go ahead. The, the the height between the bed and the uh, the heads was one of those things I was kind of getting frustrated with because they told me, well, you want to get some friction between a piece of paper and and I was doing it, but I think it was still it was still too close to the bed. So my it's extrusion, possible. it would just go right up into the head and melt, and it wouldn't even put down one layer. Because it's too close. Yeah, yeah you need to get yeah. about a 20-pound, about a 20-pound, uh, just a reg standard uh, laser or office copy paper mm -hmm. is about is about the, and you just want uh, just a barely to feel anything, and you should feel that same amount of friction. It's it's just very light, and you want to feel that same amount of friction. On all corners of the machine, so you know the, the the front at the front of the machine and the back of the machine on the right and the left. Flash yeah, Force actually came with a, uh, a, a piece of paper, a cardstock, just okay. to do that. <laughs> and that's what a lot of people do. What I do um, is I have some actual feeler gauges, some flat feeler gauges, and I use a point one, which is what most of them identify, point one millimeter, and that's what I use to do mine. And also, Chris on a previous show had a dialer. So um, to um, write, you still have that? Yeah. That allows yeah, you with I, the, yeah, yeah. His, uh... this, this helps me. Uh, yeah, I actually, so this snaps on, I built this, or it was, it was on Thingiverse, was somebody had posted uh, for the TAS-5. And what this does is this actually snaps onto the head, and it's a, it's a dial indicator for, uh, um, that you can buy from Harbor Freight for about 12 bucks. And so There's that tells you down this 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 does one thousandth of an inch increments, and uh, and tells you exactly how. So I can see exactly. So I can get it close, but then you still, you know, because this thing's moving around and there's a little bit of play in it on the head. This gets you really really close, and then I still use a piece of paper, a piece of office paper to really dial it in and get it perfect. Maybe you should sell that invention. 
No, no it's this, out there on this is open source. Yeah. yeah. But there's also right. one for the Flash Ford Creator Pro as well, so you should go look for it on Thingiverse. And oh, okay. you can do the same thing. And that's what I suggest as well. And I agree totally with the print whisper here. If you don't have a, a correct bed level, you'll never get a good print. Never. Uh, in fact, and, and I mean not just because it may ad adhere properly, but your f first layers are important as well because if your if your part has to be accurate and your first layers are flat, it's going to distort your part. And and the other thing I wanted to mention, Chris, is that he also owns uh, Simplify 3D. Or, yeah, Simplify 3D, and so they have a bed wizard in there that you can utilize. Uh, so it automatically goes to multiple points, and then you can set up your own points as well. And then when we get off air, I got something, guys, to tell you, but I can't talk about it on air. Um, so we're getting already into the last hour, and I really wanted to bring up one more item to give you guys an opportunity. So have we covered everything for everybody? Well, I wanted to show one more thing. Uh, oh, I, that's right. I got my anniversary gift for my wife uh, from Shapeways. It was a... Uh, the, the, the theme for nine years is bronze and a pot. So this is what I made her. Can you guys see that all right? Uh, now, how did the letters come out? The letters I took out. <laughs> they oh, didn't yeah. come out. They are just too oh, okay. small, so I think we're going to have somebody uh, actually uh, put, put some uh, uh, letters on it for us. But uh, it came out pretty well. So the... You know, this part here, the, the chain's going to go through so she could wear it as a necklace. Wow, very cool. But I mean, I mean, those are, those but, are little roses, right? Yep, little roses. And then I took a heart from, I uh, forget where I got it from, but I hollowed it out and I cut off the top, and there you go. Pretty Amazing. Cool. Pretty cool stuff. Awesome. Well, happy anniversary, man. Yeah. yeah. So very. Now, your anniversary already occurred, right? It, it did, it did, but uh, see, Devon thinks your anniversary is still coming up, so I told her it, oh, it, it was May fifteenth. But uh, I, I finally got this printed and and sent out, and now she can wear it, so it's it's pretty nice. Very cool, and she's got something unique that nobody else. And that's the cool thing about this is that you know using Shapeways, your own printer, you can mm -hmm. do things that have never been done before, and I think that's the real strength. You know, people say, well, who wants to build a doorknob? No, that's not the whole thing. It's taking yeah. your imagination and creating a tangible object. Make and, a doorknob that looks like a dragon's head that comes out <laughs> to where you, you grab go. it. I and... think you should do that. So somebody who says, well, who wants to make a doorknob? Or what's the yeah. other one? A like, hanger. You know, you're not thinking very much, I guess, but uh, not meaning you guys. I mean, obviously, we're all creative thinkers here, but those people who say that don't really understand the potential here. All right, guys, we are past an hour and a half, and I really want to show this before we get off because I spent almost, actually, I'm still running on three hours of sleep per night now, but <laughs> I have been running on steam to get this working, and it is awesome. And Chris, I told you to be here. This will be the next best thing to you, so um, I'm going to fire it up. I'm going to show you the, the item that I talked about earlier before we started the show was Steve, and uh, it's called Go4D. So if you guys want to get into VR on the cheap for 20 bucks, you can get these. So, um, <laughs> but what's fun is are these coming to at it, are coming at us via Pizza Hut? <laughs> Could be. Yeah. Uh, Amazon drones. They're gonna fly them to you. Oh, there you go. Amazon so, now. So let me go ahead and bring up uh, my little device here. So let me get this. Uh, what are you doing, Mike? You'll see. <laughs> it's, it's worth the wait. It's worth the wait. Twenty dollars, you say? I've never seen you get this excited for twenty dollar invention in a while. <laughs> Maybe it has to do with Star Wars. Oh, if it has Star Wars oh, in it, then it. oh yeah. Well, I guess it, it has. It could. All right. Hang on, guys. We'll be there. Audience, I again apologize, but all the batteries went to sleep on me, and now I have to... You need one of those battery revivers. I have... Trust me. I mean, you saw how I go to these these shows. Okay. <laughs> he has to carry one of those Tesla Powerwall <laughs> batteries. All right. Here we go, guys. 
<laughs> Recruit, there welcome we to 2715, Whoa. or at least our viewport into it. So you can, can you walk see up me? that pressure switch to drop a box. Can Even you see my own head? Yeah, so this is the game that we played, right? Um, this is similar to the game, except now we've converted it into a stereo, and now notice how I'm now moving. But they put into, and if you can still hear me, and I'll talk Oh, it's really just a loud. little thing that goes um, right on there. Behind me because as you get too close, it starts bringing in the real image. Actually, I can do it this way. So you can see how the wall's now there, and because it's flat, it's a flat wall. But notice what, watch what I can do. Uh, there's my hand. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, with this, it becomes kind of like a, uh, like an opera glass, and that's what Brian calls it. He calls it the, the VR opera glass. And so now, watch, I'm going to get up, and I'm going to switch so you can still see me. So notice how I'm still moving around. And watch, <laughs> go out and reach out, touch that. So I'm now touching the rail. So this is where those gloves would come into place, then you get a response. Now I'm going to go over here and walk. <laughs> and obviously I've, uh, I'm limited. He's gone. Can you walking? Can you see? Can you get the sensation yeah. I'm walking? Yeah, we around? can see. Look, I can go over here, and obviously I, I don't have a lot of space. What wasn't that cool? Yeah, very cool. Very Opera fun, glasses. Honestly. And where? So and where do we? Me? Where do we pick these Sorry. up? Where? What are these Opera glasses called? Sorry. Uh, what were we saying, Chris? What are What are the Opera glasses called? What are they called? They're called Go 4D C1 Glass. <laughs> In the same font as GoPro. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, it starts with Go. Yeah, well, okay. you have to come because okay, you got, at the beginning got, of the show. Got, we, got, we had the CEO on. Don't worry about it, guys. You'll get your pair. I'll, I'll, I'll send you guys out some. Go but it works with any phone. Go 4D. But the actual website is www.googletech.net. Goggle Tech. Go I'm sorry, Goggle Tech. And uh, they, we have covered them earlier on with yeah. Steve. We had the CEO. So we've already done all that. So okay. you're behind the scene, Chris. Okay. I, so, missed, I missed the boat. Okay. So this we actually had running at the, the show. And I went to their booth with this. And he kept grabbing people and said, you got to see this. And what we found, though, is that most people just said, oh, that's cool. You can do this. And I said, no, you can move around. What do you mean move around? You can move your feet. And then, so they started moving their feet, and then they realized that the world was moving with them. <laughs> Battery power. And, and that's so many people did not understand that this environment. That's why you got to have something on there that actually gives you instructions. Well, we're working on that. Obviously, this was a prototype at the time. Yeah. And, uh, boy. That's cool as heck, though, Mike. Okay, well, we're not done yet. One more trick. One more trick. So if you remember, one of the other things that I was working on is converting the Homido or Homido system, which is this here, into an actual headset, and I created a, a new brace for it. And we actually had one of the representatives in the occipital booth, who we did an interview at the end there, but now I'm going to put this on the front of it in my special bracket. Oh. Okay. I'm I'm leaving you guys. I'm going into another world. Star Wars. <laughs> Star Wars. Maybe not. Great job. There's the box now. Okay. Pick it up Bye, by guys. pointing directly at it and then holding down the right thumb button. And he's gone. <laughs> he's in the VR. He's in. He's like Tron. So obviously, if you're in a larger room, it's much more enjoyable. Uh, yeah. So we obviously came up with like a lot of fun things to do with it. You know, I was thinking you could create a scene where, you know, like a lab explodes and pieces go all over the place, and you have to get them all back together. Otherwise, the place would blow up. So they would go like behind a cabinet or something. And I was able to get on the floor and crawl around and look behind things. And, you know, the thing is, you remember, Chris, you complained about VR sickness? Yeah. Adam, 
You don't have that there. And the reason for it, the reason for the VR sickness is because your head can move, but the objects are moving, but your body's not moving. And your brain knows that's not what you're doing. Well, here, you're still moving. Right. So if you sit down, you know you're sitting down. If you crouch, if you move, it was awesome to go through one room to another because I felt I was actually going from one room to another because I was going through the archway. I could go up and look at one of the walls and see it get closer to me. Uh, the, the items that you see there, the rails, um, you could go up and touch them even though they don't provide that response, but now we have a product that will. You're like there. And I said, I want to stay here. I want to <laughs> hang on. I'm going to go away and I'm just going to hang out in my little world. I've got these little <laughs> floating balls and just, you know, have a little music piped in and I'm just going to hang out here. You, um, you know, you know what's funny, Chris, is he was walking back and forth and there were stairs to the right. And I'm like, just don't fall down the stairs, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd you'd, fi you'd find yourself in a in a uh, uh, virtual hip <laughs> replacement surgery. <laughs> oh, no, no. Uh, uh, sir, uh, I heard you do three D printing. Would you mind uh, <laughs> printing your own uh, hip? <laughs> yeah, so so I I can see I can see this now. This is like this is like an outer limits where there's like a guy in a mall. He's in a mall. And he has a headset on, and he's peering. He's looking out, and like he's wearing one of these, and it looks like nature. So he's walking around the mall, and it's nature. And then there's another guy in nature, and he's like, "Oh, on," and he's peering into the mall. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? He's, <laughs> yeah. like, he's like doing virtual shopping. He's in nature, and he's virtual shopping. There's a guy in the shopping mall in virtual nature. It's, just, uh, yeah. it's funny. We need to do that. Actually, we yeah. should do that. Yeah, we should make funny. a little. Yeah, Chris, we'll need to get together. <laughs> we'll be wearing goggles. You'll be out. Big sir. Because that's what I, I do. I see tremendous potential for uh, the shopping experience to go virtual. I mean, to have a virtual marketplace to be able to actually, uh, uh, like, be able to examine items you're buying virtually. Well, Take Beyond some time, picture. Chris. Take some time and watch the videos that you missed being yeah. the guy on the other end. I know. Because I had to do it all by myself. I know. The same quality, and you get an opportunity to see <sighs> yeah. what you're talking about. There are people out there using this for shopping. Who was it? Um, oh, Lowe's. They won one of the Augie Awards because they did. they are doing exactly that. They have a cube set up, and you can go in it and look at different things that belong in your house. <laughs> and then there's another place you use an iPad and you can look at different furniture. Yeah, it's, but yep. The Lowe's was cool because you put on a headset and you literally are in this box looking at stuff that would go in your house. And right. you know, was, so they won an Augie and there's a couple of other people that uh, won obviously some Augies. Uh, uh, there was a guy, there was, you would kind of like this, there was a harness system where they were an Oculus and then it, they pretended like you were flying. And they had fans in front of you, so as you change your body position, like, you know, you put your More hands behind fans. you, uh, the fans would uh, increase in uh, right. velocity and give you more wind. And then if you yeah. put your... So <laughs> the illusion, was, I didn't get to try it, but watching people, <laughs> I thought it was pretty cool. So and I, and I had titled that one particular one because I went to see it before I did it. It's up, up, and away. It literally was like a Superman experience. So. Did you feel like you were flying over a Panda Express uh, because somebody was eating Panda Express right there? <laughs> it was blowing the fumes right on you. That's funny. Like, I'm I flying, wish... but it smells like... <laughs> McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> McDonald's French fries, 10,000 feet up. Yeah. You know, actually, the VR scene was mountains. So, so uh, yeah. <laughs> you can imagine one of the, the Sherpas yeah. <laughs> hanging out with his French fries. <laughs> Bring KFC? What's going on? Yeah. Well, actually, it was, it was pretty neat. So if you guys didn't get a chance, uh, all was awesome. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there doing what we talked about here. You know, VR, e even though it kind of distracts a little bit from the tangible 3D printing and scanning and so forth. It is a method that allows you to see 3D objects without having to print something. 
and there were many people who were using it for the application. Uh, like I said, the, the, the early guest with his little pyramid thing, um, you could actually create an object in it and rotate it and actually look around it even before printing it. Um, right. So there are technologies and as you know, I've been really pushing to do this for medical. How about looking at CTs with another doctor? Um, I think you so. obviously get a lot of you get you get a lot of first skeptics with any uh, new technologies, um, you know. And like even even the Nintendo Wii, when the Nintendo Wii came to market, people were like, whoa, what? That's just pe that's silly. People with the wands in their hands or whatever. And it's like then you find out how fun it is, and it's more engaging. I mean, whether you're sitting in front of a TV or you're sitting in front of goggles, it's just the same. So I mean. That, that's the thing a lot a lot of uh, a lot of my friends or colleagues are like oh VR goggles now it's just the whole world is going to be uh, you know everybody just wearing the goggles and it's like well pretty much everybody sits in front of a computer screen or a TV all day and like yeah you got to have a symbiotic relationship with you know where you know you need to find time to go outside because it's not healthy to sit in front of the TV this is just a new way to interact that's even more immersive and if you're going to play a, a video game like the whole goal is to be as immersed as possible and become the character and be engaged in the game and so uh, I really see no downside to the VR momentum you know I, I really am, am happy to see this VR stuff come to light it's pretty fun and actually I think it may even be more interactive especially when you create systems like we have where you have to actually walk around you know right. so that you're not just sitting there yeah. um, well, who knows? I mean, obviously, Siobhan has a little bit of that attitude to, you know, it's just going to keep people from going outside. But you got to be disciplined and uh, do everything, experience things in different well, ways. You know, I talked to somebody. Yeah. Who, sorry. The same people are going to be sitting in front of a computer monitor, anyways. So whether they have goggles on or they're sitting in front of a computer monitor, it doesn't. It's not really a difference. It's not like oh, all of a sudden I'm going to. It's like the people that have the discipline to go outside are going to do it, whether they have goggles or a computer screen. It doesn't matter. Correct. So, well, and the other point is, you know, I'm obviously a few years older than you, both of you, but uh, I had, for encyclopedias, you remember what those are? You know, you had pages. Yeah. I had them when they were just like black and white pages. Now, yeah. with Google You're Cardboard, old. Yeah, Wikipedia. <laughs> it's called Wikipedia. Uh, yeah. um, but uh, now, kids in classroom can put Google Cardboard and hopefully. Go 4Ds in front of their eyes and experience a location that we would never. You know, people say, "Well, why don't you just go there?" Well, I'm sorry, I can't afford to go to the Great Wall of China, um, and many people can't. So, if you can give them an experience where they literally feel like they're walking on it or can see it up close, why should we take that away? You know, I don't think people who have that attitude should think that way. If you can afford to go somewhere and visit something, do so. I'm not going to take that away, but if well, you and can't, it's, it's the next best thing. And it's enabling the other the other great part about like VR, for instance. What I I see a lot of problems obviously happening with the centralization of education, um, you know, and that's a whole other uh, topic for another day. But uh, you know, education is uh, definitely a, there's a major decentralization movement going on throughout the internet with things like Coursera and online curriculums, online college courses and all these curriculums being built, um, you know, even iTunes University and MIT OpenCourseWare and all these things, and being able to make those experiences now uh, compete directly with an academic institution where you don't pay tuition or your tuition is greatly reduced and you can do it in your own time and you can feel like you have the college, college experience because you can attend a class and feel like you're really there and you could even ask questions or you can interact with a teacher or teacher's aide or other students and be in an but not have to be live uh, you know states away so that you can go and it, what this does is this opens up education um, I just I just see so much potential uh, for VR to make our everyday interaction with our computer or our video game or whatever it is more immersive and so yeah. if, if you can lit if you can write I mean, why we use word processors now? That's the technology of the time because the experience for writing is better on a word processor than writing by hand or using a typewriter. It just is. It's like it's more immersive, and it can do it. the tools in there enable you to do more, more, more efficiently, more quickly, and more cost effectively. So, well, and and obviously, I'm old enough to realize that the refrigerator still existed when I was a kid. I couldn't imagine a time unless I went camping. Now, remember when you go camping, like you have to get ice all the time? 
That's what people used to do before our time. And if they didn't get ice, they either ate their food right away or they, they used other forms of uh, preserving it that we don't even think of now. Uh, we, we spend so much time before surviving, we now don't have to do that, that we can use it to think. And I think that's one of the reasons that we've evolved where we're at. Well, we're getting into all kinds of things outside of what people really probably want to listen to, which is our 3D. So I'd like to thank you again, Chris, James. Awesome. And take us away. All right. Well, I uh, appreciate uh, this last-minute little uh, bit of info. I learned a lot today, and uh, can't wait to meet up with you guys again next week on another episode of All Things 3D. Bye.